Imagine what it'd be like if we were really curious about each other. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relational Spirituality, the weekly podcast of LargerStory.com, the podcast that sees all relationships as spiritual and all spiritual formation as relational. Now, here's your host for this week, Roseanne Moore. Hello, Larger Story audience. We're so happy to have you back with us today. I'm Roseanne Moore, your host at the Relational Spirituality Podcast, and I have with me my co-host today, Carlene Cannon. We are looking at the Papa Prayer during this quarter, and we have some stories to share about how God has met us in that in a really personal way. Carlene, I want to start with you. This actually goes back to 2022, right? 2022. Yeah. When we did the summit as a memorial to celebrating Larry's life and his, the way that he, his ministry touched so many lives. And I want, so we had been working for months to get ready for the summit. And Over a year, really. Like, yeah. Yeah, it had been a big undertaking that we had been heavily vested in as a team and personally. And yeah, it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And, and in the midst of that, something happened with you yeah. that I want you to share about. So go ahead. I'm going to let you start sharing okay. your story. Yeah. I think I need to give a little bit of background. Um, my broader story, just to understand the significance of this particular event. My story is all wrapped up in father. I had a series of men in my life who had the title father. I had a, a biological father who gave me up when I was born. I was adopted. Then I had an adopted father who obviously took me in as a baby and stepped into that role. But then over the course of my life, just gradually disappeared such that by the time I got married, he was largely not part of my life. He didn't help with college. He didn't come to my wedding and he just gradually faded out of my life. And then I had a father-in-law who stepped in and made a lot of promises. Like you finally have a father and that did not go well either. And God graciously gave me people like Larry Crabb. I have another Larry who's very important in my life who have shown me and fathered me spiritually over the years, but that place of father was always nebulous and empty and not really, not one of the positive parts of my life. And the idea that a father would give good gifts to his children was always something I cognitively believed, but didn't actually experience. Then another part of this story that's going to be really important was when I was 18 years old and applying to colleges and really wanted to, I grew up in Texas. I wanted to go somewhere different. So I had one application that I could afford to send and I chose Duke University. I'm really not even sure why, except the cover was beautiful on the little brochure they sent out. And that's where I ended up. God provided miraculously tuition was more yearly than my mother made. Lots of things had to come together for me to be able, even able to go. And that was one of my first experiences of God as a father providing for me. My father actually signed a paper that said he wouldn't provide for me. And so God stepped in in all sorts of ways to make sure that happened. And those four years were fantastic. And a lot of that revolved around basketball. If anyone knows much about college sports and Duke University, that it's all basketball all the time. And when we were there, our four years there, we went to the final four, all four years, and we won two national championships. So basketball was just a big part of our life. And we continued that with our kids. We have lots of family stories about how important basketball was and my little six-year-old praying for a win and it had just all sorts of different things. It's where I met my husband. We got engaged at a basketball game. We got married at the cathedral on campus. My daughter went there and met her husband. So our whole lives have been part of the journey of Duke basketball and Coach K. So 
when we get to the summit, it, it turns out that the weekend we had planned the summit was going to be the weekend of Coach K's last game at Keyrandor Stadium ever. And it had been hyped and it was a big deal for lots of reasons. And when I realized that I wasn't even going to be able to be home and to watch the whole day of festivities, and it was really sad. It was like a loss. I experienced it as a loss because this had been such an important part of my life and such a place of joy for me. And so I just was struggling with that reality. And we had some friends who, who had also graduated from Duke about, I don't know, 15 years ahead of us. And he had season tickets and throughout the years, he had given us those when he wasn't using them. And so a lot of our story centered around getting tickets from our friend Jack and being able to go and see games. So we had been with them in early February at a game. And they were telling us that they had an option on some extra tickets for the Carolina game, but nobody ever gives up their tickets for this game. This game is like the biggest, especially when it's Coach K's last game, like the biggest game of the year and biggest ticket. Even President Biden couldn't get a ticket. Yeah. They were selling for like tens of thousands of dollars. So when they said, we might get tickets, I was like, sure. And then they said, I'll let you know. And I was like, there's lots of people in line ahead of us. They had three sons and two of their sons were Duke grads. So it was a real long shot in every way. But there was something in my heart that was like, ooh, I would like that ticket. You know, I would love to be in that stadium for Coach K's last game. And it was completely out of the realm of possibility, but the seed was planted in my heart. And so every time there was something mentioned about, and of course, this is the biggest news because Coach K is retiring after 40 years, this storied career. So it's on every TV commercial. And so lots of opportunities for me to communicate my desire back to God and just say, I'm going to really miss not watching the game. It'd be great to be there. Just, just this ongoing conversation about this thing that was important to me that seemed almost, it seemed shallow and seemed almost ridiculous because I was also completely focused on this summit that we were doing. And that was consuming most of my time and energy. And I had deep desires for that to be honoring to Larry and significant for the people, almost this competitive set of desires. And I just kept handing them back to God when just saying my heart, and I really want to be insured and do this thing for you and for Larry and for larger story. And I really want to be in Cameron indoor stadium or at least be able to watch it on TV. And I'm just going to leave that in your hands. And so it was just this relational conversation that I kept having with God over about four weeks. So we get to the summit. It's going really well. I guess I should give a little more background. I, I was going to say, look, one thing that strikes me in what you've shared so far yeah. is the fact that you didn't just go, this is not the spiritual desire, right? Like, I just need to focus on the spiritual desire. Right. You, and maybe even like repent of like, yeah. uh, the selfish desire instead yeah. like you put it before the Lord and you were like, yeah. I'm going to let you sort it out. I love yeah. that. I love that you didn't try to tell him what he should do. You just came and presented yourself honestly to him. I think that was a real struggle because it did feel very self-absorbed and worldly especially because you've got this summit going on over here that you know is a great spiritual significance and you've got a basketball game <laughs> like the scales are pretty obviously tipping one way and yet the desire was so strong that I just couldn't like parse it myself and I just said I'm just going to, yeah, for, which is unusual for me, honestly. I'm just going to own this yeah. and let you know how I feel every time I feel it and 
see what happens. And I think there was something in me that recognized that God is going to do what he was going to do at the summit with or without me. And of course, he's going to do what he's going to do in Cameron or Stadium with or without me. But I could trust him that I could be where he wanted me to be. And even and my assumption was in that, that he wanted me to be focused over here and not even watching Coach K on ESPN. That was my assumption in that. But there was this sort of belief that I'm not that important either place. What is important is what's happening with me and God, and that can happen in either place. I think part of what makes this story more than just a shallow wish to go to a basketball game was this journey I had been on with God for about 12 years where he was regularly and consistently and even miraculously trying to communicate to me that he was delighted in me. And this was a really difficult message for me to internalize and own for a host of reasons I won't get too bogged down in. But there had just been a series of events over the course of 12 years that God kept telling me, you are my delight. Like, I delight in you. All of these other things you get so hung up on don't matter because I have chosen to delight in you because I see you through the righteousness of Jesus and I can delight in that and who I created you to be. And I mean, I just struggled to take that from my head down into, you know, who I am and my relationship with God. So this was a journey. And when we get to this moment, the first night, Kent Dillinger was speaking and he brought up this whole topic of delight. And honestly, what happened to me was this sort of, oh, great, here we go again. <laughs> I thought, what else are you going to do, God, on this one? Because I know I'm being stubborn and I need to repent and, and all of these things. And I, I experienced that whole kind of journey of frustration and then the listening to Kent as he talked and being glad of the reminder once again that God delighted in me and thought that was that was good that was the end of that whole part and we woke up the next morning and Rich got a phone call and I'm listening to him on the other end and it's starting to dawn on me what's really happening on this phone call and our friend Jack had gotten two tickets to the Carolina game and that in and of itself was shocking. But then all three of his sons were involved in things that they could not, that they felt they could not leave. And so he was offering us the tickets. And we were in North Carolina, so we were only two hours away. And so Rich says, we just got these tickets. What do you want to do? Because here I am, technically, at something I really should have been prioritizing over this game. But something in my heart said, You've been asking me how I was going to handle this. And I want you to know that I am a father who gives good gifts to his children. And I delight in you. And I knew that it would be wrong to refuse those tickets because this was about, this was bigger than a basketball game or what was happening at the summit. This was about what God was doing with me. And he had gone to such extravagant. President Biden couldn't get a ticket. You're up to get the morning of the game. And so we talked and I went back and forth, but I knew in my heart that I was not going to turn down those tickets. And it might cause trouble. I remember coming to you and be like, Roseanne, I'm supposed to do this and this. Is it okay if I just dump it on you? Because I'm going, I'm heading north. And fortunately, my, our colleague, Chris, was actually the one who was responsible for most of the summit. And I was really more of a periphery player. And it wasn't a huge upheaval for me to leave. But it did still feel like I was shirking my responsibilities and abandoning you guys. But surprisingly, 
we drove out of the cove and I was like all in and in this experience that God had just handed me. And it was a delightful day. It was in some ways, it was a little bit of heaven. We were there celebrating. We were, it was just, and there was so much like reminiscing and it was celebrating someone who had done something really significant. And then we get to the game and games in Cameron Indoor Stadium are fantastic in any scenario. But this one was particularly full of energy and it did not go well, however, like <laughs> We lost that game and we lost that game badly. And my heart was broken for these young men because they're 18. Most of them were about 18 years old and they have got the entire world watching them and the pressure of winning this last game. And there was just a lot going on. And I remember a conversation in my head with God. This has been such a great day. And so unexpected. And I felt like I'd really lived it with God. Like he was just with me throughout the day. And I, I was just like, this was b- about five minutes toward the end. I'm like, we could still pull this out. It'd be really great if we won. Like that would just like cap off this virtually perfect day. And there was just this little whisper in my heart of, you're not in heaven yet. Don't be deceived <laughs> by how good this is. This is not heaven. And and I, I just thought, okay, that doesn't in any, uh, losing this game doesn't in any way change the significance of the day for me. It doesn't take away from the time that I had with God and that he orchestrated for me. And I wish it had turned out differently. And I'm not in any way saying that I had any responsibility for the outcome of the game. I absolutely did not. But it was just God's kindness to make it clear to me that whatever I'm going through in life, there's always a reconciliation of really good and really not good. And the really not good doesn't change the really good. The really good can change the really not good. but the brokenness that that we live in doesn't change the reality of God's great extravagant love for us. I just got to the end of that day and there was this certainty that I might still struggle to feel like I'm a delight, but I can always look back on that day and know that God wanted me to unmistakably never question that he is delighted in me and he would go to great lengths to communicate that to me and there were lots of things that kind of came off of that tendrils and different things that came off of that story but one of them i think is is almost like my story birthed in some ways, or at least ignited or was a catalyst for an even bigger story that we're going to talk about in our next episode. And there was, for me at least, something in that connection to somebody else's story that also reinforced for me what God is about. That day felt like it was me and God, but it was really me and the community, the the body of Christ. There were just lots of other ways that God was working. And so when I gave up the sense that I was important over here and needed to stay at the summit, it was almost like it released the spirit. I'm not communicating this well, but it was almost like in, in not having to stay here because I thought I was important here. It's like God did all of these other things over here that I, that might not have happened if I hadn't done and just followed his leading in ways that almost felt sinful to me, if that makes sense. And I, yeah, I was thinking as you were talking, you, it was humility is accepting who we are with God, right? It's not making ourselves too small or too big. And so by, by letting go of 
letting go of the role at the summit and Mm -hmm. receiving what he was offering you, like you accepted you. It's like you embodied Mm -hmm. who you were in his presence with your, in your relationship with you. And that actually did release what the spirit was going to like do next, but also do in you. And that was important. I, because I think of when you're talking about this, Father issues are a big deal. Like you had a lot of lived experience yeah. that had reinforced that that issue of delight. And so for you to open your heart in that moment and say, I'm not going to earn your delight by staying at the summit. Mm. I'm going to receive your delight, yeah. by receiving yeah. this gift you want to give me. Yeah. That's a really, I think that's a big and beautiful thing that he was yeah. doing. That's a really good way of articulating what I was struggling to articulate. <laughs> and uh, I think you're absolutely right. If I had stayed at the summit, there would have been a sense of earning something and pleasing someone else. I was very aware of what other people might think about me just abandoning my post and leaving the summit. And that was I'll just be honest, that was part of my challenge was what are people going to think about me? Because I also knew like the next day I had to talk to people about, here's how we're doing a larger story and I'd be passionate and are they going to wonder how committed I am if I'll just up and leave for a basketball game? But it was interesting. I actually had a conversation with, with Jim Crest, who was there as we were leaving and I told him that I got tickets and I was just sharing my struggle and he was like, are you kidding me? Go. Just go. It was actually it was so encouraging because he got it. He got the sort of reason for going, not just, and I didn't even share all those details about what it was doing in me, but just the bigness of this gift. If God's given you that gift, go. So I think that's Actually, maybe you said that I hadn't quite absorbed. When you said that, Roseanne, I do think a lot of my story with God has been trying to earn something. And so the miracle of being able to just let that go and receive was a really big part of what made that day so special. How I'm I'm curious as you look back on that in the how is that staying with you? How does that, has that, is that something you're still, does that feel like a one-time trophy event or is that something that you're still able to access and live into? Yeah. And that's a really good question. I have tried to navigate my spiritual life largely by trying to get it right. And one of the things I struggle with is the desire to borrow from one of Tim Keller's phrase is to be my own savior. Like I actually want to just do it. Like that just feels safer to me. If I can do it, then my bases are covered. And and there's lots of reasons why I operate that way. But I think in addition to the sort of sealing on my heart, the delight, the idea that I have to do it right, and that's more important than following the spirit into places that feel strange or weird or like they just couldn't possibly be true (laughs) and I think it gave me some courage to step away from the safety of trying to do it right and to just rest into the reality that I hear from the spirit and I can follow him even when it doesn't necessarily make sense and that there, that that is where the delight comes from. That God is not as happy and thrilled by my attempts to get it right as I am. <laughs> and that's actually a really good thing that he just likes me and just wants me to want him. And the pressure's off, to quote another of our favorite books. And I think that was the whole part of that experience was this real tangible lived experience of choosing against getting it right and just how freeing and beautiful that was and that God could really meet me in a way 
that my attempts to earn had been keeping him at a distance previously. For sure. And so I do think, and your, I think your question was, how does that stay with me? I had a real sense that day that this was a landmark moment and that I needed to somehow hold on to that. And I sent an email that just, we're in the car driving to the game. So I'm typing up this email just to capture what I was feeling and what was going on. And then so many other things happened after that email. But I, I do hold on to that and look back at it just to remember when I'm struggling with the sense of delight. And then I think God, in his kindness, like I said, he kept telling this long story that started to weave other people in that also just keeps, in case I forget, he's going to keep reminding me in all of these other ways. And I think what that's done and where this kind of comes back to what Larry's saying in the Papa prayer, which is just very relational. So much of my prayer life in the past has been, I've done index cards. I've done prayer lists. I've done, I've had the little sheets where you check off when it was answered and all of that. There's, there's it's a, it's very systematized. And Larry's talking in the public prayer about something that's very relational. And that's how I experienced this, both in praying leading up to it, because I'd have to just keep saying, this is what I want. And I'm really sad. And I just leave it with you. Yeah. And then experiencing the whole day with God, just like, I can't believe I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. Just this ongoing conversational interaction with God. And then even in the aftermath, as it continued to unfold, it's been a very rich relational experience that I think is so much bigger than the gift of the day, which was huge. Yeah, because when you came and told me, I didn't think, oh, she's abandoning her post, but I thought... The summit has all these really rich conversations and she wants yeah. to walk away from it. Okay. <laughs> it's a little weird. And there was definitely a sense of loss as I was driving away because I did feel that. I did absolutely feel I'm actually going to miss out on what's mm -hmm. happening here. Mm -hmm. So that's very true. And, um, yet, and yet the Lord was actually speaking something really deeper to your yeah. heart probably yeah. than what would have happened in those conversations. Yeah. I was, it, it wasn't until I got your email that, and understood the significance of what you were sharing that I realized there's, there was so much more to the story than just, Hey, we got tickets. Isn't right. cool. <laughs> what struck me about your story was it wasn't just, it was even just God saying, I delighted in you, this matters to you. I want to, but it was like layers of provision, like Duke mm -hmm. had been a place of provision. So it was like, God was Absolutely. taking you back to layer yeah. after layer of pro provision for you. And then going, I really want you to know, yeah. I see yeah. your heart. I want, like, I'm giving you this gift. This yeah. is important for, with all of those many layers behind it. That's right. Even just the whole sort of part of the storyline that's about fathering, Larry had been a real voice of fatherly love and input, especially in the last 12 years. And there were moments in this whole thing where the dis where it felt disloyal because that was all about honoring him and a, a memorial to his life and his impact. And yet it was also some of the conversations I'd had with him and some of the things that he had said. Even one time I was at SSD and he's actually talking to another young woman on stage and he makes, he, he says to her, he's not talking to me. He says to her, because she's talking about her father and he says, I'd really enjoy being your father. And it was like, he talked to me. I don't even remember how it impacted her, but I just started sobbing. Larry had just been a really important part of that storyline in my life. And in some ways, it was like God was using him again in a kind of unexpected way to, to 
I think that was part of the reinforcement of what God was doing in being a father who give, who gives good gifts. That just underscored that experience for me that it was connected to Larry at the summit. Yeah, I can see so, that. Yeah, there were lots of levels that are still becoming more clear um, right. as we keep loving this thing out. So, yeah. And well, I think that's, I think everybody has those kind of things in their life. Like God is really a God that weaves a tapestry. There's a story arc maybe, but it's a lot more than one line. There are just all kinds of things that intersect and impact and that he's pulling threads through to make a picture that might not be clear in one moment, but all of a sudden you get a glimpse of all the richness of that tapestry. And only God can do that. We're just not that smart. Right. Krista Wells has a song, a thousand things are happening in mm -hmm. this one thing. That's one of the lines from it. Wow. And that really, okay. we don't always, that's always going on, but we don't right. always get the peek behind the curtain that. Yeah you got with what happened with you. Yeah. No, that's um, very true. We're going to wrap up today, but Carlene made mention of what was the story that came out of this, that email that she sent. And I was so glad that she didn't just go and just have a good time, but like that she mm -hmm. shared the story of what happened with us because, because the Lord then sparked something in me. And that we're going to talk about that in our next episode so come back next week thank you for being with us today carlene thank you so much for sharing all of that with us i think there are a lot of people in our audience who can relate to the wrestling with we were talking about this in book club actually often when we bring our prayer requests and we don't want to do the laundry list thing like what's really going on is not the thing we're asking for it's the underlying question is god a good god who is going to take care of me like in a way that my father didn't in your case yeah. you know yeah. um how does he see me does he delight in me am i do is his love something i have to earn all of those questions yeah. whenever when we're looking at things in the middle east the wrestling over what does it look like to be cared for by god in the middle of a situation that looks so hard yeah. for the mother who's or parent who's a child oh. who's um, does God love my child as much as I do? Those are the underlying things that happen in our hearts and in our lives. And so thank you for sharing some of your journey and how God unexpectedly, like I, what I love about your story is how like subversive it was. He used the yeah. basketball game for Pete's sake. Yeah, the draft, the draft. yeah exactly. It was just so subversive that he's, I really want you to know this is how I see you. <laughs> I love that. Um, so thank you listeners for being with us and we're going to wrap up for today, but please come back next week as we, yeah, you don't want to miss the rest of the story for sure. Yeah, there's more <laughs> as we talk about the pop of prayer. Thanks so much. If you like what you heard today, hit the like button just below. Then come back by subscribing to our podcast channel. For more resources on relational spirituality, go to our website at largerstory.com.